everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Zara Morani of Morani Law, and we're going to be talking all about private lending. Zara is going to walk us through how she vets a deal for her clients and the things you want to look out for if you're interested in doing some private lending transactions. Before we get into it with Zara, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it, Zara. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day to join us and talk all about private lending. Uh, why don't you give us a bit of an intro on who you are and what you do both as a real estate investor and as a uh, real estate lawyer. Thanks, Darren. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I am, as you know, uh, involved in, in private lending and real estate law on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I help my clients with buying, selling, refinancing their properties. Um, and over the years, I guess, just organically, and um, because of my, my family's background in lending, um, private lending has become a niche of mine. Um, and so <clears throat> it started about seven years ago. Um, I was just doing deals for family and, you know, things that came in and I guess we quickly developed um, a reputation that we were able to, because of the control in the transaction between the lender and um, the, the, you know, the time frame and whatnot, that we could put these deals together quite quickly. Um, we've developed quite a reputation for being able to close urgent transactions. So um, we get, you know, sometimes we have brokers who come in with deals that need to close in 24 hours, the finances fall apart, the banks not backing up the purchase or whatever the deal may be. Um, and the borrower needs 70, 80% loan to value. And instead of having to go to a lender and then the lender saying yes, and then them having to find a lawyer who can close it the next day, they know when they come to us, um, we have the, the lenders available and we're only gonna say yes if we can do it. So I think that's probably where um, the success has come from, um, just being able to hold the whole transaction together and close quickly. Why has private lending, to me, in my, my opinion anyway, uh, become so popular as of late? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I would say that the lending, private lending has become more and more popular over the past probably three years or so. I think we're <laughs> the year's gone so fast, it's hard to believe. But I believe, I think, yeah, 2017 January is when the um, stress testing was introduced. At that time, the banks um, introduced this new form of testing, which kind of eliminated um, clients who previously would have been approved for bank financing. And nothing really changed with respect to the affordability factors or the circumstances of the borrower, just that the bank started to, um, to look at the file differently and not approve as many files um, in terms of, of mortgages. And so um, it brought private lending to the forefront of, of you know, kind of real estate investing or brought it more into the, into the, the light. Um, I think previously it's been looked at traditionally more as like a under, you know, kind of like a, a shark world and um, something that nobody wants to do private lending. And there's, um, there's like a negative connotation that was previously sort of related to, to that part of, of lending. Um, Fortunately, I think that's coming, that's changing. And, you know, we work hard to make sure we work with, um, with good lenders and good borrowers so that it's a mutually beneficial um, short-term relationship between them to get um, the borrower out of the position of this private loan um, and into whatever the next step is for them, be it refinancing into an A bank or a B bank, or even sometimes we have property investors, as you know, who it's worth it for them to pay 10, 11% on a mortgage because they're making 30% on their return. So they'll quickly flip around the property, um, do what they got to do, sell it and get out. And for the lender, of course, it's beneficial too, because it's a great um, investment and it's secured. So we're not talking necessarily about promissory notes and things like that, although we can do that, you prefer to stay on the secured side. And, and, and why is that? Well, to be clear, I advise against the promissory note. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people are like, oh, but it's the cheaper option, but it is not cheaper on the back end of any issue. Um, so, you know, when, when somebody lends money against a property, 
um, and if we don't secure it, there's a risk that without the security on registered on title, that the property can sort of anything could happen with the property. Somebody, you know, if if I promise to pay you hundred thousand dollars and I say to you, you have my house as collateral for that hundred thousand dollars, but don't register the mortgage on my house. I'm just promising you via this note. Um, I could go and register a $500,000 mortgage on my house in the meantime, while I'm keeping up with the obligations of the note, um, or I could sell my house and I don't have to tell you and you don't have to sign off on it because you've not got um, any registered security. Whereas with the registered charge on title, my property, basically I can't do anything. I can't finance it. I can't sell it. I can't do any encumber it or um, dispose of it in any manner without you approving and me paying you out. So the security of, of a mortgage and a registered mortgage um, is 100% advisable. I think that's prudent advice, obviously, uh, from, from your perspective. And also in my experience as well, I, I've seen transactions go sideways on, on promissory notes. Um, and it, it's, it's not a fun situation to be in. So I think, you know, when you can secure, I know those higher interest rate promissory notes are enticing for a lot of people, but to me, uh, to, 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 to make a small, slightly less interest uh, on the, on the loan to be able to have that security is a, is a huge benefit. Yeah, and if you were to lose that hundred thousand and try to sue me on that, and now I show no money, then Ave lost her costs of potentially of suing. If you can't get anything out of me, and I've moved my money around from the sale, um, and B, you've lost your hundred grand versus the maybe two thousand bucks or whatever it is to to register um, the mortgage. And that comes from the borrower side too. So for the lender, there's no cost. So as a lender going for the promissory note with maybe 2% extra or whatever, um, it has a lot of risks and, and it's a zero cost to the lender either way. Explain the process, Zara, just for people that haven't done private lending before. Um, you get a request from, I'm guessing, uh, brokers in a lot of situations or, or clients of yours. Um, and then where does it go from there? Do you send it out to your network? Um, you know, do you have people reaching out to you if people are interested in private lending? You know, how do they get in contact or what's the process to be a private lender on your list? You're right. I get requests from brokers. I also get requests directly from borrower clients. So as a lawyer, um, we don't need a broker's license because we're governed by the law society. And so um, we are able to... Um, to help put these deals together. So if, if a deal comes in, be it from a borrower or a broker, I gather the necessary information from them. So what's the value of the property or approximate value of the property? What's the total amount of the loan required? Um, what's the, so the loan to value is what we call that. So mm -hmm. um, typically speaking, I would never recommend over 80%. And even right now with it being COVID and, and the situation being what it is, um, there are some clients who 75 is kind of their new 80 benchmark. Um, so I keep in touch with my lenders. I know what their ongoing parameters are. I look at each deal. I find out what's the borrower's um, credit score and like the information of their profile to kind of vet the deal. So I do underwrite the deal to an extent. Whoever I send the deal to, it's up to them to do their own due diligence in that respect to understand if they want to move forward with the deal. Of course, then when we do the legals, it's my responsibility to make sure that all the legal checks are in place. Um, but with respect to the underwriting side, you know, I always tell my clients, if I was in the position that you're in saying to me that I want to lend only on first mortgages up to 70% and under $500,000 and all the different check boxes that you've given me, because I know my clients, um, generally speaking, I have, when a deal comes in and I vet it quickly, if it's something that I would do in my client's shoes, then I know pretty much the two or three people who I'm going to send that particular deal to. For those people that are not familiar with it, Zara, can you explain the process of how private lending works from beginning to end? So I forward the deal to those couple of clients at max. I don't look around outside of my own client base. Um, and I will within, I would say within less than a bit. I mean, if it's urgent, if the deal has to close tomorrow, which I have got, um, I can pretty much turn it around quite quickly. Like within one to two business hours, I can quickly turn around and say, all right, I have 75% loan to value. I now need to get moving on 
confirming the value. So you say the property is worth 1 million. I need either my, um, I need someone from my lenders team to go out and value the property, or I need an appraisal in my hands from um, one of my lenders approved appraisers. If you don't have that already, it's gonna be cheaper and faster. And if it's an urgent deal to get us to do the valuation for you, like one of the lenders um, representatives to do that for you. So we work with trusted realtors who will go out and give us the opinions of uh, their opinions of value. Um, and we can kind of not have to worry about the appraisal side at that point, which which is more costly. And if it's an urgent deal, it, it will take more time. Then once we have the value confirmed, um, and if you've got an appraisal and you say, well, here's the appraisal, it shows it's worth a million bucks and it's from one of your lenders approved appraisers, um, which is typically the home trust list of appraisers, um, we can say, okay, we can do 75%. I will draft the commitment, get it out to the borrower or the broker, whoever, however we're, this is, this is happening. I need the borrowers, then I need the sign commitment, retainer, and um, the other signs lawyers information. So it'll depend here if I'm if I'm working for the lender, then I need the borrower's lawyer. If I'm working for the borrower, then I send my own lender to another lawyer. So I have partners outside of the firm who we can send um, our lenders to if we get conflicted out because you know, we're not allowed over $50,000. The Law Society does not allow for the same lawyer to act for both parties. So then we do all the title searches, off title searches, documentation, making sure we have like information about any existing encumbrances. Um, we, if I'm acting for the lender, we'll, we instruct the borrower's lawyer um, to say, here are our conditions, here are our documents, this is what needs to be signed. Once all the conditions are met and all the documents are sent back, fire insurance, proof of tax payments, like et cetera, whatever the list of conditions are, um, it comes back to us and we will release funds. And in the meantime, we're lining up funds with our lender. And then once all the conditions are met, we will release funds. Give us a bit of a breakdown on, the, on, a, on a first mortgage, what the expectation is in terms of interest rate um, that people are going to be borrowing at and they're going to be making if they're on the private lending side? And what are some of the conditions that would be on a first position mortgage from the private perspective? So a, a reasonable sort of average rate of return, if you're looking at somewhere between 70 and 75% loan to value, let's say, you've got two parts of, of the payment um, that comes, like two parts of your return that comes into the lender. Generally, you have a lender fee, which is paid up front from, it, it's held at source when you do the loan. Um, and then the interest rate. So between the two, the interest rate and the lender fee, uh, your yield would be somewhere around at 70 to 75, you're looking between eight and 10%. Let's talk about second mortgages um, in how they vary in interest rate and in what you'd be looking for in terms of security and loan to value. So second mortgages, um, the reason you're gonna make more and the average return is probably somewhere between 14 and 16%, even at the same loan to value, 75 to 80 tops. So the reason that second is more risky is because now you're sitting behind a first mortgage because the second lender needs to be aware that if the first mortgage is in default, so that means that the borrower is not paying the first mortgage, um, that the, either the second lender could easily lose their position because the first lender may take control of the property and look to initiate the power of sale proceedings, which they're entitled to do um, in Ontario, to take in order to, to get possession, like to get the power to sell the property, um, which we'll talk about very briefly in a few minutes. Um, yeah. but, uh, but the second position lender, in order to keep their position, either has to pay out the first mortgage in full or keep the first mortgage in good standing by making those monthly payments. So like you can quickly see why in second, your risk is higher and so is your return. Um, and, and also, you know, what would have to be done in order to maintain your position versus if you're in first position and there was a default, you're in the driver's seat. What's your best piece of advice for, for investors who are interested in getting into private lending for the first time? You know, if you're a new lender, you maybe want to stick at 65% loan to value. The deals may not be as fast and furious in terms of coming in and volume because everybody wants the 65% loan to value deals. Um, stick in an area that you know, talk to someone who 
like, I'm, you know, we do these education type chats with our clients to say, okay, you want to get into lending? Let me understand what is your goal? Why is that your goal? What are you willing to risk to get to your goal? And, um, you know, by the time we're done with them, sometimes they may be like, okay, you know what, I'm happy with 2% less because there's a lot less risk involved in that. Um, and a lot less, you know, there's a lot less potential cost too. We, um, so I would always look at the strength of the application of the borrower, um, you know, make sure that you know how to value a property. Don't take at, um, don't take it for granted that because you have an appraisal that says a property is worth a million bucks, that it's actually worth a million bucks because the borrower would have potentially, or the broker would have potentially got that appraisal and instructed the appraiser to say, you know, this is the kind of the magic number we need. So always take a really close look at that. If you need to do your own backup of that sort of valuation, it is worth um, driving out there, like going to look, getting an agent involved. And sometimes, you know, we do say like as part of our underwriting process and because you're not using one of the appraisal companies that are on our clients list, um, we would we, we need a couple hundred bucks to go out and look at the property and make sure that it is what what it seems to be on paper. I think probably like to cut it short, um, speak with somebody who knows what they're doing in this area. Make sure that you're not just getting involved because you see big numbers and you see big returns and you're like, oh, my lawyer will look after it and, and I can just kind of roll the dice. Um, you know, we cannot take responsibility for for any sort of loss, it is on the, the lender client to do their own due diligence and the loss is their own. We just have to put the balls in motion to make sure that we are as secure as we can be. And the Law Society requires that we do have them sign off that they understand we are not giving financial advice. So understanding the process of, of the underwriting side and um, working with people who you can um, trust and and learn, like, I think it, it needs research to get involved. And if somebody wanted to reach out to have a chat about that, um, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, Zara, I thought that was a really great breakdown of private lending from an overall perspective and just the things that people can watch out for. Um, I think it's hugely valuable to hear your perspective on it, just somebody who's in this realm day in and day out and you having seen all of the different things that can happen. Um, because I think, you know, ultimately we want to secure our investments as, as much as we can and make the highest interest rate possible. And so I think many of us are looking at getting into private lending for that reason. And I want to thank you for your time today of, of, of diving in and going through this. If you guys enjoyed the session with Zara, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Zara and myself. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Zara, thank you so much for being here, taking some time out of your day to walk us through private lending from your perspective, both as a lender and as a lawyer. I can't thank you enough. Um, I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And I know that our paths will cross very soon because uh, from, from our conversation earlier today, we're working closely on our next loan together and I'm excited to get, get that wrapped up and move forward. So thanks again, Zara. I know you're super busy this time of year. So uh, I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate your invite again. Cheers.